It's uh, terrific to be in Melbourne. I always jump at the opportunity to come to Melbourne. Um, big fan of the place, not because of the uh, uh, football, but uh, actually it's the architecture that, uh, that really grabs me. And in fact, what you really see when you, when you come to, to Melbourne and to Victoria is, uh, is the legacy of, of the mining boom of, of the 19, 19th century. Um, the other thing I like about Victoria is it's, it's um, sort of almost as far away as possible from, from, from the mining boom in Queensland and Western Australia. And it, it, you really feel when you come here that you're sort of in a normal place and you're in a place where people aren't so completely bedazzled by mineral riches, which is really what is happening to the rest of, uh, of Australia, where we really think that we just can't get by without um, you know, digging a bigger, bigger, bigger and bigger um, uh, quarry in, in this country. Um, as I say about um, Melbourne and Victoria, you really do see, see that the, what we did in the, as a country in, in the 19th century was we took capital out of the ground and, and we actually invested that capital in, into beautiful buildings and, and infrastructure and we used that money to build cities. Um, but unfortunately in Australia we're actually doing less of that as, as the boom rolls on. I talk also about um, what I call the digger generations who came back from the two wars last century and really built our cities and, and uh, our infrastructure, our, our, our water resources and all the things that we take for granted today. And um, I suppose a good question to think of though is how we'll be regarded uh, in 50 years or 100 years from now, our present generation, because in fact what we're doing as a country, particularly as this mining boom gains momentum, is that increasingly we're taking the capital out of the ground and we're spending it, and we're spending it on current, current consumption and on, on transfers as we become, I guess, a more welfare dependent uh, society. Um, I got the Bureau of Statistics to crunch some new numbers that are in my book um, because the data on unfortunately is incomplete, but what it shows is if you look back to the 1960s, um, we used to spend twice as much as we do now as a share of GDP on capital investment, that is the, the three levels of government, uh, local, state and federal. And that's a difference now in current day dollars of about $25 billion, so it's almost one uh, national broadband network uh, every year that, that we're not investing. However, at the same time, we actually are spending um, about twice as much on the transfer payments and on consumption expenditure. So this is becoming a bit of a problem because, um, as I say, increasingly uh, the revenue that governments are getting is, is coming from that, that capital that's in the ground. I have actually described what's going on now, and in a, quite a provocative way, deliberately, but I do call it uh, generational theft, that increasingly what we're doing by relying more heavily on mining to fund our everyday lifestyle, that we're essentially robbing our grandchildren and their descendants. Um, and I think this is something we really need to think about and plan for and have better policies in place because if we continue, I don't think our grandchildren and, and, and future generations are going to look back on us um, in, in such a great way, in the way that we look back on, on what I call the, the digger generations. Um, what is really going on in, in Australia now and becoming a mineral dependent uh, country is, is actually not that different, if you think about it, than if the government was to propose saying, well, we've got a floating exchange rate. We actually don't need to have all those foreign exchange reserves that the Reserve Bank has sitting on its, in its balance sheet and all that gold that it actually has sitting in its vaults. We actually should just really spend it because we want to improve the productive capacity of our economy and all these excuses that you hear that uh, some of people find to spend money, nation building and this sort of thing. Um, because what we're actually doing is we're essentially running down quite dramatically our, um, our mineral wealth. Um, now as I said there's actually nothing inherently wrong with that if you're actually using that money to, to invest in capital, to build infrastructure, but unfortunately as I say we're doing, we're doing less of that. We have become a very mineral dependent country. Um, currently about 60% of our export income comes from um, um, mining and energy uh, exports. Now that's about um, double 
double what it was uh, a decade ago and in the 1980s, early 90s. And it's probably going to increase to possibly 80, if not 90 per cent. And that is because of the huge investment that's underway right now, which is going to um, quadruple our exports of liquefied natural gas. And and quite possibly double, if not treble, our um, production of iron ore and coal. Um, and this is very risky. I think inc increasingly, as well as, um, as, well as uh, stealing from our grandchildren, I think we are um, engaging in some pretty risky behaviour. And uh, I think that's why we do need better policies in place to manage our resource wealth. And uh, I talk in the book about um, some of the experiences overseas, which unfortunately our politicians are just ignoring and, and not really um, that interested in. What we've done as a country, for example, in the last three years of the Howard government, uh, they, that government received a windfall uh, of tax revenue in the order of $330 billion. And they spent 94% of it in the form of tax cuts um, and sort of middle class uh, welfare. And uh, I use some colourful language in my book to describe that. Um, now, if you look at the, and then the GFC came along and the Rudd government then went into debt to the tune of $107 billion. Um, uh, which doesn't seem to be a very clever way to, to, to run your budget or to run your country, to go this, this sort of feast to famine existence. And it really does get driven a lot by, by what happens with mining, because with mining booms, you get this sort of economic effervescence, everybody thinks it's going to last forever, and we just start spending all the money. We drive up inflation, we make ourselves worse off, um, and also then we, we run out of money when the boom ends. Take, for example, Chile, uh, a very similar country to Australia would believe, actually has slightly less mineral dependency than what we do, about 50% of its exports come from its um, copper. It uh, quadrupled its sovereign wealth fund from $5 billion. This fund had been set up in the 80s when they had IMF intervention. They quadrupled it from five to 20 billion. And then when the GFC came along, they used that fund, or part of it, what was called a stabilisation fund, which was really just to get you through the economic cycle. They used that fund to, to weather the GFC, and they managed to get through the GFC without um, racking up a single peso of debt. So that seems to be a pretty clever way to operate. The idea that you need to save for a rainy day and we need to save because what we're doing is high risk, um, the boom won't last forever and so we need to save as a form of insurance. Um, another reason why you need to save is uh, you need to say because we are dealing with finite, I often say this as sort of the double, just to finite non-renewable resources. And a lot of people in this country, unfortunately, don't think that's the case. We actually do suffer, suffer from a huge misconception, an enormous fallacy that we have endless amounts of iron ore and coal. Um, we don't. For example, um, our diamonds, uh, the figures are put together by Geoscience Australia. Uh, it's the government uh, geological survey agency. They're actually based on, on estimates published in the annual reports of companies. And these are companies that, that would have a vested interest in, in telling us that they've got a lot of resources because that increases their share price. Um, diamonds, 20 years. Gold, 30. Silver, lead and zinc, 45 years. But these estimates, by the way, are based on current levels of production. Iron ore used to be 100 years. It's come down to 70. Um, but think about this, and there's a bit of a, a, a bit of misinformation being put about that we don't take into account the fact that the companies are gearing up to double, if not treble, production. So it's more like 35 years or even 20 years. Now, of course, we could find more, but the point is, particularly with minerals, we haven't been turning up El Dorados every year or even every decade. In fact, the last big so-called world-class find was 36 years ago, Olympic Dam, 1970. Um, but the really big lie actually is in relation to our gas because that's subject to forward contracts, all publicly available, yet the federal government tells us that we have 63 years of gas. But in fact, another report elsewhere tells us that the companies are gearing up to triple production this decade and quadruple it over the next 20 years. So 
The idea of saving is also a good thing because um, it's, it's a form of insurance and also it helps you not to allow your economy to be so unhinged, which is what's going on now in this country and become sort of caught up in this, in this minerals frenzy. The idea of what Norway and Chile and East Timor have done is they've built up these big funds and they've put the money into foreign currency. Um, they've also taxed their resources much more effectively than we have. Norway's nominal tax rate on petroleum is 70% compared to the, about 32% under, under the, the new proposed um, mineral resource rent tax that Tony Abbott wants to abolish. Um, so those countries have taxed more effectively, they've saved, they've put the money into uh, foreign currency funds and that's allowed their other exporters to continue to, to make a living and not to get completely uh, driven into the ground by the mining boom which is what's now happening in this country. Um, just a few rules I think we need to come up with in order how to manage this. Um, a lot of people are now talking about this idea of a sovereign wealth fund, but I think we need to think first about how we're spending the money to, to have some sustainability about it. And I talk about a model that was developed for Papua New Guinea a few years ago, and it's based on a principle of spending the average. And it's basically like setting up a sustainable rate of expenditure. You take the 20 year average for all mineral revenue, company tax, uh, payroll tax, royalties for the last 20 years, and that becomes your spending limit. And anything above that, um, is automatically saved into these funds which can be used for stabilisation or for, for future endowment. Um, in recent years, our Treasury officials have gone to Papua New Guinea as, and they've been working there doing great work and they've helped them set up these three new funds for um, stabilisation, for uh, investment in infrastructure and for future endowment. And, um, but the problem is that it, it really is hypocritical because we're not doing this in our own backyard. I mean, this is a real blind spot in our public policy debate. Um, and I think it really does reflect um, a lack of leadership. I mean, extraordinary thing is that uh, indigenous people in this country are actually doing much better than the rest of us. Uh, Cape York, for example, it's the people up there have been saving putting money aside from their bauxite revenue, they've now got a fund in the order of $60 million. And the idea is what you're really doing is it's quite an amazing concept when you really think about it. You're basically setting up a fund so that you transform a non-renewable resource into a financial asset that lasts, can last forever. So finally, to finish up, I, I'm not saying we should save it all. We should find a balance, and having the spending, the average, would be a way of doing that. We do need to invest in, uh, in infrastructure, but um, let's do it in a sustainable way. Uh, spending all the money in the boom years is not very wise. Um, and uh, for example, if we do come up with great projects, if, there's a, if there is a very fast train that, that is compelling, um, there may be a case of presenting this to the parliament or maybe even setting up a tripartite commission. Uh, the parliament, say the Reserve Bank and another institution. So if we need to go above the average, we can. If we have a flood in Queensland or a cyclone, instead of having a new tax, we could call on this fund to get us through the crisis or, or the GFC. But I do think at the end of the day, we need to think about what I call poly-proofing these, these savings and the money we get from our mining, because otherwise our politicians are going to blow it and uh, that will make all of us worse off and it will most certainly make our grandchildren and their descendants worse off. Thank you very much.